Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We are about to uh, kick off this meeting. We have a fun time before us, believe it or not. I mean, St. Paul's, we always do annual meetings the right way. We call the 169th annual meeting of St. Paul's Church to order. Good morning and welcome. Let us begin with prayer. Almighty and ever-living God, source of all wisdom and understanding, be present with those who take counsel in St. Paul's for the renewal and mission of your church. Teach us in all things to seek first your honor and glory. Guide us to perceive what is right and grant us both the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it through Jesus Christ, O oh Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Danushka and Idris. And now we will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the 168th annual meeting of St. Paul's, which took place last year. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Are there any corrections to the minutes which are found in the back of the annual report? No. <laughs> Not seeing any. Uh, all those in favor of approving the minutes, we will uh, launch a poll again just to make this official. Okay, thank you. The minutes are approved. <clears throat> and now we're going to take a look back on the year that is behind us. Let's take a look back at 2020 and see how St. Paul's has come together. If you have a copy of our beautiful printed 2019 to 2020 calendar, you might have seen the fun youth events we scheduled for each month in 2020. We were so excited for extreme bowling, ice skating, rock and jump, and parties at the beach. Then the coronavirus arrived and laughed at us for making plans for youth programs months in advance. Although we were unable to gather in person, Curtis and I met with a fantastic group of middle and high schoolers on Zoom every Thursday night from mid-March to September. We played games, made crafts, and prayed together. Curtis is still working on his friendship bracelet. In September, our confirmation class began meeting online on Wednesday nights for the PATH Bible study. This is our group covenant, written by the confirmands. Be respectful of opinions and ideas, listening to people and limiting distractions, including side conversations. Engage in conversation by supporting and encouraging fellow classmates' ideas. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Encourage each other to be leaders and to use our superpowers for good. Each week, they inspire me and give me hope for the future they are creating. That was quite an adjustment for us to adjust to COVID. We were feeling very confident following a board meeting that we were going to be open. And two days later, we were closed. And we closed for good. We didn't know what that meant. In short order, it was clear that it was going to last longer, probably for the school year. Stayed connected with the children, did activities with the children, and everything went beautifully. We did that for the whole rest of the school year, and then spent the summer getting the school ready for a September opening. That involved construction, protocols, scenarios for open in person, open on Zoom, closed for two weeks, four weeks, whatever required, quarantining and taking care of the children. Parents were incredibly grateful. Between the staff and the parents working together to keep 
healthy children in the building. Uh, that is what's kept us open for all these weeks. Thank goodness we are plugging right along. As for our harps, we hung them up among the trees in the midst of that land. How shall we sing the Lord's song upon an alien soil? How indeed, in a time so alien, in a world turned upside down, beset by crisis and sorrow? Can it be that barely a year ago, we were celebrating the brilliant success of the Boar's Head Festival? It seemed like a harbinger of great things to come. And it might well be, just not yet. The choir sang its last service in the church on Sunday, March 8th, and suspended all rehearsals on Thursday, March 12th. It has not gathered as a complete ensemble since then. We have kept the light alive as best we could in several ways. Electronically, the choir remotely recorded a new anthem for Easter Day, a favorite treble anthem for the second Sunday in May, and then a special anthem honoring our graduates in June. Last autumn, our efforts centered around creating a full-length video of our annual Festival of Nine Lessons and Carols, a monumental project given the very thin, relevant expertise of the producer. But many hands and voices came to the rescue, and the project was fun and a great way to pull people together Combined Caring Connections Ministries witnessed to Christ's love and grace in our midst, providing spiritual and physical presence and support not only to St. Paul's parishioners, but to the greater community through coordinated efforts with our clergy. Amidst the overwhelming COVID-19 safety protocols and restrictions, our faith community banded together from home, knitting and crocheting prayer shawls hand painting prayer stones and placing them in a basket on the low brick wall outside St. Paul's old post road entrance with a sign inviting passers-by to take a little piece of St. Paul's with them. Crafting sock snowmen and candy cane mice and covertly leaving them on the doorsteps of 20 of our elders' homes and on safe tables outside area senior facilities, cooking meals, delivering groceries, visiting from front porches, and praying, praying, and praying some more. In conversation with Audrey Hubner, our prayer chain matriarch, I learned that 2020 was an unprecedented year for prayer requests, citing an overall increase in general intercessory prayer, witnessing to an increased outpouring of care and love for each other, keeping the 14 members of our prayer chain very busy. And while we could not safely gather together, we remain together in the spirit. After a 15 year hiatus with the blessing of the Reverend Curtis Barr, the players proposed to stage once again the Boar's Head Festival and not just the festival as if we had done it before, the original festival, but rather a newer, bigger, more dramatic version of the festival. And so the Boar's Head, a festival of light, was born.
This was a most difficult year for many of us, for our nation and our world. While baptisms and confirmations took a hiatus, prayer requests surged as we grappled with illness, anxiety, job loss, and tension in a particularly volatile election year. Some were able to use this year to take stock of their lives, to cultivate a deeper sense of what is most important and of what is not worth our time. With a return to some sense of normalcy on the horizon, we look forward to being together again. The life of St. Paul's has not stopped, however. Our staff, Ben, Kathy, and John, have been working as dutifully as ever. Our clergy, Alice and Idris, continue to support and direct hugely impactful ministries of the parish. Our intern, Danushka, brings a wealth of experience to us through her storytelling, as well as through her powerful example of faithfulness as she prepares for ministry as a deacon. The ministry reports included in this video and in our annual report speak to the continuing importance of St. Paul's in our lives and in the life of the wider community, and they don't even cover half of the ways we seek and serve Christ. Take a look at our annual report. You will read about how in December St. Paul's joined a collection of churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, and civic organizations from Fairfield and New Haven counties called Connect, representing more than 20,000 people from different races, faiths, and zip codes that have joined together to take action on social and economic justice issues of common concern. You'll read about our continuing partnership with the Council of Churches of Greater Bridgeport. You will read about how this Lent we will join up with the Council of Churches Raising the Bar Becoming Anti-Racist team to bring a weekly Zoom series on Monday evenings for members of St. Paul's to explore deeper the issues of racism and all of its expressions in our society and how Christ calls us to respond to those in our lives. I invite you to take a look at the report and I thank you for all of the ways that you express God's love. Vaccines are being administered and we hope for lower infection rates in our area that will make worshiping in our sacred space safe again. I miss you all, I love you, and as I have emphasized before, God is with us all the time. Neither heights nor depths, Paul says, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. Let us pray for those connected to St. Paul's who have died. Lenora Cox. Rob Shackleton. Alberta Vargas. Thomas Wilbur. Chris McCormack. Margaret Hansen. Sally Deegan. Molly Mellinger. The Reverend Adam Lewis. Phyllis Ives. And now our outgoing vestry members offer words of thanks. It has been an honor and a joy serving this caring St. Paul's family for the last four or five years. I can't even remember. Um, God bless and good luck to the new vestry members. Thank you. Hello, St. Paul's. It's Rick Hutchinson here. It's been an honor serving on the vestry these past three years, and I look forward to seeing everyone in church sometime soon. Hi everyone, I miss seeing you so much. This is Tracy Cranston. Um, I'm leaving the vestry after three years and I'm just so proud and so grateful of the work that Curtis, our wardens, St. Paul's Nursery School and the staff has done, particularly over this past year when it's been so challenging to keep things together and just kind of roll with everything's changing so quickly. Um, I think we've done a particularly good job with our technology and keeping things moving in the right direction. I'm just so grateful. Um, and I've learned a lot being on the vestry and I'm just really happy that I had the opportunity. And um, I look forward to most seeing you all when I walk down with the choir, hopefully soon. Take care and blessings to all of you. Yes, thank you, Annie. Thank you, Rick. And thank you, Tracy so much for your service. And we will have plenty for you to do in your vestry retirement, so don't worry. 
And now we have a new slate of nominees to the vestry, chosen by our nominating committee, along with delegates to convention and the Council of Churches of Greater Bridgeport. I am thrilled that all of these people have accepted the call to lead our parish and to represent St. Paul's, especially given the particular challenges of this time. But to make it official, we will need to vote. And the nominees are, for Vestry, Christine Cook, John Grau, and Melissa Clear. For our delegates to the annual convention of the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, we have Fiona Andrin and Wendy Cudmore with Joanne Fredericks as an alternate. And then finally, to the Council of Churches of Greater Bridgeport, we have Susan Tom. Thank you all for agreeing to be nominated. And now it's time to vote. Thank you. And now is there a motion to approve this slate? Uh, three for three year terms to the vestry and others as delegates to our diocesan convention as well as to the Council of Churches of Greater Bridgeport. Is there a motion? So move. Is there a second? Second. second. Is there any uh, discussion or anybody want to warn them? No? All right. Um, if you have a question, you can always put one in the chat or just wave, wave around frantically and someone will, someone will find you. Um, so in that case, we will vote for this slate with a new poll. I should mention, um, because the video didn't include it, that all of the members of our executive committee wish to continue in those roles, and they are Fiona Andrin and Michael Boyd as wardens, Caroline Marshall as treasurer, and Caitlin Haggadis as clerk. Please vote now. You should see the poll on your screen. Yes, to approve all candidates on this slate. I would say that that is pretty conclusive. The motion carries. <clears throat> welcome Chris, John, and Melissa. Thank you, Fiona, Wendy, Joanne, and Susan. Everyone, let's welcome them by using our clap, clapping hand reaction or just clap your hands on the screen, whatever works for you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And now we will move on to the financial report. You're on mute. Uh, and now it's uh, time to welcome uh, Carolyn Marshall, uh, our uh, treasurer for the financial report. Great, thank you, Mike. And Curtis, this is going so beautifully. I hope this first live presentation isn't going to upset the routine of the, of the annual meeting. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Caroline Marshall. Um, this is my first time as treasurer at our annual meeting and it's truly an honor to be here to serve you in the parish today. So I'm gonna be covering two th topics. Um, first out, I'm going to report on our 2020 financial performance against our budget. And then after that, I'm going to talk us through what the plan is for the budget for 2021 and, and highlight some of the key points. So as Curtis has said, um, this was an incredibly uncertain year on many, many fronts, and the financial environment was no exception to that. Um, however, I'm very happy to report that we ended the year 2020 with a budget surplus, and we were able to make a, a, a number of decisions around allocating expenses as a result of that that will help us in the future. First of all, on the income side, of the ledger. I want to make a re, in fact, all of us in the festry and with Curtis, we want to make a heartfelt thanks to all our parishioners who continue to give during a time of great uncertainty, their pledges. It was really extraordinary because we ended the year when we looked at the pledge and non-pledge related income, we were at 97% of our budget that we set out at the beginning of the year, which is just incredible. So thank you to everybody in the parish. In 2020, though, we did have some income shortfalls. Um, we had with some reduced income, not surprisingly, from um, the nursery school gift. Our fundraising was, con was constrained, obviously. However, we were the beneficiaries of a PPP loan. So for those of you not familiar with that term, it's the Paycheck Protection Plan that was part of the CARES Act that the federal government announced. 
So overall for the year, in terms of income, we came in at 105% of our expectations. Turning to the expense side, we obviously had a shift in our operations due to the pandemic as we went remote. We saw savings in a number of areas. First up, professional musicians. As you know, we um, did not have uh, we, we did not have them for several months in, in, early in the pandemic. So we saw some reduction expenses there. Office administration expenses came down, as did you, uh, church utilities. And we were also able to, from an audit perspective, do a review in 2020 versus a full audit, which saved us further expense. In addition, we saw less activity in our hands-on ministries, notably home front, our food pantry shopping, and assistance to our social workers. So those all came in below expected. So the bottom line is we had more income and we had less expenses, which led us to a surplus for the year. And so as a result of that, we were able to expense the installation costs of a generator and the, the very necessary repairs to the balance steeple through the general church budget um, rather than um, through, another, uh, through the maintenance fund. We're also going to be repaying 20,000 to the endowment loan. And then the balance of the surplus we're applying to the church preventative maintenance fund. So that's 2020. Turning to 2021. I'll just say up front, if there's a full copy of the 2021 available for inspection in, in the uh, parish office for anybody who wants to get into the details. But overall, we took a very conservative and very similar approach to how we constructed the 2020 budget. We did make a key assumption, which hopefully will play out, which was that we will be opening sometime this summer. So that affected how we assumed budgets for the front half of the year versus the back half. We budgeted for slightly slightly less income than we budgeted for in 2020. And this down to a couple of things. We looked at the pledges that we had, have completed to date. We already know that the nursery gift is going to be less than it was last year. And of course, our ability to fund rate is gonna to continue to be constrained this year. As you know, um, we do manage our, our expenses very tightly. And so we have set the budget up that they are going to increase by about 1% in 2021. And Caitlin, if you could just pull up that pie chart, that'd be great. So as you can see, if we look at the expenses here, there's sort of some major buckets. A lot of our expenses are fixed. We've personnel and building expenses that really it's quite difficult to trim. But this year, we're going to uh, have to also do a full audit as well. Last year, as I said, we had a review. We're going to have to do a, a full audit, audit um, which is going to bring some additional expense. But overall, our budget, we expect to come in balanced for 2021. So that's the report out. Again, thank you to everybody for your continued contributions in 2020. And again, the 2021 budget is available for review in the parish office if anybody would like to see it in more detail. Thank you. I think I'm passing to Jim Buggy. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Caroline. This is our budget as it stands now, and we're counting on everyone who is able to make a pledge to the 2021 annual fund, Grace Abounds. As of today, we are at $246,770 of our $348,000 budget, only increasing our overall goal modestly this year. To date, 93 households have pledged, and this morning we will be officially kicking off our capital campaign, but our most important fundraising effort is the annual fund. This is how we maintain our ministries, so it's crucial that we all support it to the best of our ability and whenever we can. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Caroline. <clears throat> and since so many have already faithfully pledged to support this community and all of the ministries of St. Paul's, we are going to bless the pledges that we have received thus far. And so I invite you wherever you are 
to bow your heads as we bless the pledges. O oh God, in whose creation we discover a gift freely given, help us to understand that all we have comes from the outpouring of your generosity. Inspire in our hearts a deep sense of gratitude and move us to share what we have received with the same immensity of spirit in which it was given. Lead us, we pray, to give as we have received abundantly, generously, and joyfully, that our common ministry may continue to bear witness to your unfailing grace. Teach us, we pray, that in giving we receive. Accept and bless these pledges offered for the mission and ministry of St. Paul's. Bless those who have offered them to you in thanksgiving for all the ways in which you bless us and our community of faith. Give us courage, insight, and grace to use these gifts to nourish your people and to proclaim the reconciling work of God in Christ. In the name of God, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Curtis. And thank you if you have already pledged to Grace Abounds for 2021. And if you have not, but plan to, please send in your pledge or go online. You'll find the link to the Grace Abounds website in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we now welcome Mike Bales with a report on our investments. Thank you, Mike. I was wrestling with the mute button there. And good morning, everyone. Nice to be with you all, albeit uh, virtually. Um, been asked to uh, make a few comments from the investment committee, which uh, just as a reminder, the investment committee is a group of dedicated uh, folks, including uh, members of the vestry and dedicated parishioners whose, whose role primarily is uh, the oversight of the endowment investments uh for for the parish and that basically is um you know setting things like investment policy statement meeting with our investment manager uh, and making sure that there is alignment with the uh, need from the parish for supporting the operational uh, cash flow uh, as well as the future needs of the parish and trying to keep that alignment and uh, frankly preserving this great resource we're fortunate to have uh, not only for the current generation but for future generations um, pleased to report, um, well, before I start there, I guess, as I pen this report every year, which uh, I've been doing now, I, I'm afraid to say, I'm not afraid to say, I'm proud to say, it's been 18 years I've been writing this report, I think, uh, as a member of this committee, and um, it seems like every year when I sit down to pen it, there are some uh, extraordinary set of circumstances that uh, I could write about, whether that's something going on in the parish, uh, or something in the capital markets, and certainly 2020 was no exception. For the details around the report, I'd refer you to the, the, the annual report itself. But, uh, you know, as we entered the COVID environment, COVID changed everything for us, not only personally, but it certainly had an impact on the economy. And it wasn't lost on the capital markets and certainly created an incredible volatility of this resource and asset pool that 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 we rely on to support the parish as well um, i think it was probably in the april time frame maybe curtis when you you, you asked me to uh, sit with the vestry and we had just experienced uh, roughly a third decline in the s p 500 over a period of 23 days uh, and to put that in perspective the endowment fund had a drawdown of you know the market value uh, roughly eight hundred thousand dollars in in from the beginning of the year um, the good news is um, this these periods of market volatility always seem to test our conviction around how we've allocated the assets and uh, is it appropriate knowing how, how important it is to our support uh, but I will say the good news is um, the discipline that the vestry uh, has maintained not only in its spending but also in our commitment to a long-term strategy. We've been through periods like this uh, a lot and uh, we were not only um, fortunate enough to make back uh, the portfolio uh, unrealized losses, the portfolio was able to grow year over year. Uh, we don't have the final total returns from our investment advisor but you know, when we make the adjustments for our annual draw, uh, on top of last year's pretty significant gain, we were able to grow the portfolio, uh, the total return 
uh, of about seven and a quarter percent, uh, maybe a little bit higher. So we were able to not only meet the current income uh, requirement to support the parish, but continue to grow the fund a little bit, which is which is incredibly important. Um, just a, a couple of quick thank yous, um, you know, not only to the um, investment committee members, which are listed in the report, uh, but also I think it's important. I, I don't think we give enough, um, I think it requires a shout out to the vestry and the parishioners here uh, for their discipline. Uh, as you look at the annual draw and the discipline, I mean, you just heard Caroline talk about, you know, repaying once again, a pretty significant chunk of the endowment loan that we had. Uh, I've seen it many, many times, not in this parish, but others I've worked with that once you borrow money from an endowment, it's awful hard to pay it back. Uh, and we're in a very fortunate position and we made a payment in 2020. We're going to make another one in 2021 and that doesn't happen. Sorry, uh, zoom, zoom hazards. Um, that doesn't happen without the dedication in the, of the parishioners, number one, and, and the uh, discipline of the vestry. They've kept their, uh, you know, the, the spending rate at which we draw from the endowment very disciplined and it's come down over time. Uh, there were times when we were drawing up to 5%. Uh, the forecast for uh, this year is in the low fours and I commend everybody for that discipline because it will allow this important resource to continue to, to be able to sustain you know, a consistent level of support for the parish. I mean, Caroline talked about the variability in our income stream. This one resource has been pretty stable and consistent over time. And uh, it's uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have that. So again, special thanks to the committee members, special thanks to the parishioners and the vestry. Uh, and just one final ask, um, as anybody who is interested in learning more about the endowment, how it supports the parish, uh, we do a good job at reporting that in our financials, but uh, please reach out to myself or any of the committee members. Uh, and we will, uh, we welcome Chris Cook as the newest member of the investment committee. So Chris, thank you for uh, your willingness to participate. And we welcome any and all people learning to do more, join the committee to please, uh, please do reach out. Does not require any technical expertise. In fact, some of our best input comes from people with no financial background. It's important that the parish understand that. So we welcome any and all new members. So I'll stop there, Curtis, unless there are any questions. Thank you, Mike. St. Paul's is a very special community because of all the wonderful people we have seen so far. And now we are proud to officially kick off Heart and Home, a $640,000 capital campaign for St. Paul's. When you enter our building, you quickly know that if these walls could talk, they would tell a story of a community that has worshiped, that has learned, served, and celebrated in these spaces for many generations. Since we began creating a vision for a capital campaign, much has happened in our world that continues to challenge us all. We are constantly called upon to respond to the issues of our day. That requires sustained prayer and action, unity and hope and compassion for all God's children. Heart and home speaks to the values of St. Paul's, a community of faith grounded in Christ's love and committed to changing lives by meeting the needs of those in our parish, our neighborhood, and beyond. Every step of the way towards restoring and renewing our facilities has been marked by heartfelt, imaginative, and holy conversation. The campaign for St. Paul's is meant for all of us for the parish, the nursery school, for our neighbors, and for those we have not met yet, for generations to come. To achieve our ministry goals and restore our campus to serve our present and future needs, we need every single person to participate in whatever capacity possible. Now is the time to complete this capital campaign journey. Now, just as those who have come before us had our ministries in mind when they expanded and cared for these beautiful facilities, now we have the opportunity to ensure that St. Paul's continues to serve our community into the future. 
Over the past year, having discerned our ministry needs, tested the feasibility of the campaign, and decided on a scope that we knew would be achievable, we set to prepare to seek pledges from our members. This campaign has been helped tremendously by a few of our own parishioners. Caitlin and Charlie helped to develop the materials. Kathy Comstock helped to produce many of the materials. And many of you have helped us with the early canvassing. Over the last two years, we've completed really large, major capital campaign projects. The first one we did was to strip all this paint off and then repainting all of the wood around the entire church. This year we did the repointing of the brick, all of the brick throughout the entire church. Where the brick was falling off, it was replaced. Where mortar was degraded, it was stripped out and replaced. So those were two very large projects that we completed. And this summer, we also converted two unused offices into an additional nursery school room on the first floor. And that was a, an exciting and very worthwhile project. Well, ahead of us, we'll be adding a new family bathroom and updating the fixtures in these two bathrooms, we have a few repairs to make. <laughs> in addition to the bathrooms this coming year, we will be replacing flooring in the gathering area and in the hallway leading down into the kitchen, adding air conditioning to both the parish hall, the fireside room, and the gathering area as well as in the parish hall, we'll be removing the popcorn ceiling and repainting it to freshen it all up. It will really be a lovely space. Whether we do it this year or possibly next year, it's a major project, is a total revamping of the kitchen. New double door freezer, warming ovens in this area, new stainless steel counters, new dishwasher, obviously paint, new flooring, new lighting. It's a major project. It will take a lot of planning and uh, it will add a lot of functionality and use over time. Thank you so much, John, St. John. For all of your efforts in coordinating and managing all of these projects, it is no small endeavor. Thank you. And now a word from our consultant, Maurice Seaton. Hello everyone, I'm Maurice Seaton, and it's a joy to serve as the fundraising consultant to St. Paul's for this, the Heart and Home Capital Campaign. The campaign will help prepare St. Paul's for the future, bring increased engagement with the community, and result in ever stronger relationships within the parish and beyond. Every step of this exciting journey, my role is to advise campaign leadership on best practices and strategies to achieve success by inviting everybody at St. Paul's to participate. Your gift will make a difference in reaching or exceeding the goal of $640,000. I also encourage everyone to reflect on what about St. Paul's continues to reveal God's love in ways that truly make St. Paul's feel like family in both heart and home. Thank you again for your support and for your inspiring example of God's love in action in a broken world. As St. Paul's engages in this capital campaign, we look to our present, our present needs, our future hopes for participation in God's mission, and even to our past, remembering those who have contributed to the life of this community up until this point. Recently, I had the chance to sit down on Zoom with a few of my predecessors to talk about what has remained true for St. Paul's over the years. I spoke with Judith Rhodes, who was the rector from 2010 to 2015, with Ben Brockman, who was the rector from 1992 until 2008, and with Ned Prevo, who was the rector from 1981 to 1990. Judy, thank you so much for joining us. 
As St. Paul sets out on this new phase of our journey, I wonder what you remember being special about St. Paul's. I mean, there are lots of things that come to mind. It's, it's welcoming the, the nursery school children up to tell the Christmas story of Thanksgiving, you know, going down and sharing Thanksgiving meals with the children. It, it, was, it was wonderful of experiencing the extraordinary gifts of John Abdenauer as theologian and as teacher. Ben, what was one of the first impressions that you had about St. Paul's when you arrived in the early 90s? So I just went into uh, the nave of St. Paul's and walked into church and uh, walking down the aisle from the main front door, I just had an immediate feeling echoed a phrase of T.S. Eliot. Uh, this is a place where prayer has been valid. I felt strongly felt that. What are some of the joyful memories you have of St. Paul's? There's so many of them, of course. <laughs> Sitting on the front porch of the rectory for the uh, Memorial Day Pancake Breakfast and Parade. Meeting and greeting the crowds and just enjoying the day. Pretty much anything involving the choir and especially the, uh, the high feasts, All Saints, Easter, Pentecost, Christmas, baptisms. I love baptism. Is there a priest in the world who doesn't I really love baptism? My joy and delight to baptize infants that I've now seen graduate from high school. And it's a great joy of ministry to have that continuity with your family. Ned, when was it that you knew that you had been warmly welcomed by St. Paul's as our rector? January of my first year there, maybe it was the second year, and um, I just, on a whim, during the announcements, said it'll be the Kansas City Chiefs by three. You know, and everybody laughed. And, mm -hmm. and that, that night, it was the exact score. It was <laughs> by three. <laughs> I got all these phone calls the next day saying, you know, who, who was my bookie? You're getting calls about the football game, you know you're part of the family. Exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. And when you were rector, you and Bev had young children, right? Elizabeth went to the school down the street. Mm. She was second or third grade. And Marnie was just a just a toddler and she she went to the St. Paul's Nursery School and that's where mm. uh, she and Amanda Sidebottom um, <laughs> became pals and are pals to this day. What a gift the nursery school is to our whole community. It was then, it certainly is now. I have great, great memories of it. And Marnie loved it, you know, I mean, she, she had a, Marnie had a wonderful group at mm -hmm. St. Paul's. And it went from the nursery school to, to the choir, to the youth group. Now, Judy, you guided our vestry and nursery school board through some important work to build on our common ministry, to build on that relationship. What was that like for you? The commitment of the vestry and the commitment of the nursery school board to reorienting our understanding of relationship through prayer, through workshops, through working with the National Episcopal Schools and doing the work with the consultant. I am so thrilled that when I read the wonderful piece that you sent me on, on Heart and Home, that the growth and development and the future of the nursery school is as central to this campaign as the refurbishment development of the ministry can happen because we have these extraordinary buildings. Ben mentioned that St. Paul's is a place where prayer has been valid. How did you experience the spiritual life of the parish? My experience of St. Paul's is that people really are prayers there. They take their place alongside the clergy as baptized people of God and lead in that way with deep conviction and deep faith. Our theme for our campaign is heart and home. Adam Lewis, who served as the rector in the 70s, died just this last November. In October, I spoke with him on the phone about his memories of St. Paul's. And he remembered many joyful times, lots of big events, 
After serving as a priest for 30 years, he retired and opened an interior design firm. He told me that he was often asked how he could go from something as sacred as ministry to interior design. And he said, well, you know, they're really the same thing. Nothing is more sacred to a person than where you live. It's where you find refuge. It's where you may raise children, build your family. It's where you love. Heart and Home is, I think, a perfect title for what St. Paul's is, is looking for as a response, response to ministry, response to the fact that we all of us are inheritors of something. We are, all of us, part of a family. Heart and Home says to me that we are woven inextricably in each other's lives and even in isolation we don't live apart from that reality a wonderful place wonderful people wonderful traditions a wonderful past a wonderful present what i'm sure will be a wonderful future Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Judy. And thank you, Ned, so much for your faithful service alongside the people of St. Paul's and for joining us once again to speak to how St. Paul's is truly a place of the heart and a spiritual home for so many. And I would like to thank everyone on the committee. Matt and Kathy Wyant, Jim Buggy and Wendy Cudmore, Lisa Callahan, and our wardens Mike Boyd and Fiona Andrin for their effort for their heartfelt dedication to St. Paul's. St. Paul's, we're at our best when we all jump in and do our part to be the church. And Heart and Home is an effort that can strengthen us, as well as strengthen our participation in God's mission of reconciliation and restoration of all of creation. Now, if you know of anyone else that we should be in touch with to be a part of this exciting heart and home campaign please contact me contact kathy comstock in the office and let us know who you would like us to reach out to now 100 percent of our vestry and campaign leadership have already made their pledges to heart and home we are charging toward our six hundred and forty thousand dollar goal and now it's time to reveal how far we have already come To date. To date. To date. In pledges. In pledges. To date. In pledges. We have raised. We've raised. Five hundred. Five hundred. Five hundred. Five hundred. Five hundred and seventeen. Five hundred and seventeen thousand dollars. Five hundred and seventeen thousand dollars. We have come far. We have come far. We've come far. We still have farther to go. We have come far, but we still have far to go. We are counting on you. On you on you. We are counting on you. We are counting on everyone to make a gift. We are counting on everyone to make a gift. Whatever gift is right for you. Whatever gift is right for you. For you. For you. Whatever gift is right for you. Every gift counts. Every gift counts. Every gift counts because we're doing this together. We're doing this together. Every gift counts. Every gift counts because we're doing this together. St. Paul's. St. Paul's. St. Paul's. St. Paul's. St. Paul's. It's like coming home. 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 St. Paul's. It's like coming home. Hi, I'm Wendy Cudmore, and I invite you to prayerfully consider making a pledge or gift to Heart and Home. You can mail the pledge, you can mail in the pledge card you may have received, or you can pledge online. Everyone is invited to participate, and pledges can be made over three to four years. If you have already made a commitment to our heart, our home, thank you. 
Thank you, Wendy. As you all saw, we are already 80% of the way toward reaching our goal. We will only reach that goal though, if we all pledge our support of heart and home. I don't know about you, but I was starting to have to hold back the tears and, and I did a lot of the editing on the video, but still, because <laughs> I think I saw some of you crying too. Yeah. Um, so please join us in making a pledge to St. Paul's, to this effort. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. Thank you for the God-given gifts that you bring to this family. Thank you for taking this opportunity to renew the enduring promise of St. Paul's, to be a Christ-centered community, growing in faith, building community, and embracing our neighbors. God bless you. God bless all the people of St. Paul's, and may God bless the ministry of this parish now and always. We'll be having a few opportunities to gather online for fun and to share the excitement about heart and home. They are listed on your screen. On the 31st of January at 3 p.m., Alumni Love St. Paul's with Fiona Andron and Wendy Cudmore. On February 1st at 9.30, Coffee Talk with Wendy Cudmore. Uh, also on February 1st at 5 p.m., Happy Hour with Matt and Kathy Wyant. And on the 3rd of February at 7 p.m., Nursery School Alumni with Fiona Andron. And a, on a date to be determined, Trivia Night with Curtis Farr. I wanna go to that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Wendy. <laughs> if anyone has questions about Heart and Home, and I'm sure there are some, um, or about anything that's going on at St. Paul's, um, anything we're doing as St. Paul's, please feel free to reach out anytime. Questions about Heart and Home may be addressed to any one of our committee members. Um, they may be addressed to the office or directly to me. Fiona Andron, who serves St. Paul's as a warden, also leads the board of the nursery school. So nursery school parents and guardians may wish to contact her. And I believe that uh, Jake Hagedis, our communications assistant here has put some of those contacts into the chat for you to reach out if you have questions. And after we officially adjourn the business of this meeting, we're gonna have a few minutes or a few moments to chat about what we've heard. But before we do, I invite us all to conclude with our very own heart and home campaign prayer, which was skillfully and thoughtfully prepared by Hope and John Ogletree. I invite you, you're probably muted. Um, I invite you to pray along muted in your homes. I'll lead us in prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal and gracious God, who knows our needs before we ask, we give thanks for the bounty in our lives and we acknowledge that you are the source of our being. Bless St. Paul's as we focus on what it means to be good stewards of all that you have given to us, our time, our talent, our treasure, and our testimony, to share your good news with a weary world. Help each of us to freely give back a portion of what you have provided so that together we might better do the work you have given us to do sharing your love with a world desperate to know your compassion and experience your grace. Send your Holy Spirit to touch our hearts and bind us together in one purpose. Shine your light through us as we engage your work in this place at this time so that all we do might be for your glory, O God of our salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Following the adjournment of the meeting, we will have time for a conversation in breakout rooms, along with time for questions. Is there a motion to adjourn the 169th annual meeting of St. Paul's? I make a motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor of adjourning the official business of our annual meeting, wave your real hands or Zoom hands. We stand adjourned. Thank you very much.